Tokyo, November 5th, 1941, midnight. Sabato Kurusu quietly sits on his bed. Despite his caution, his wife Alice, an American who Kurusu met on assignment there, wakes. I'm going to the United States, probably, Kurusu says. When? replies Alice. Morning. He explains that American Ambassador Gru has called in a favor to delay a Pan Am flight out of Hong Kong so Kurusu could make it via naval plane. He is to be a special envoy delivering a peace proposal to Roosevelt. It's cold. Alice wraps a blanket around him. This mission will be a dangerous one. Militarists had plotted to assassinate Prime Minister Konoye due to his peace platform, and one diplomat had already been murdered for getting too close to Gru. So they decide their son, an army engineer, will ride the train with him. That way, reporters would think that Kurusu was seeing him off on a deployment. And the next morning, the two head out together, with Japan's last hope for peace sitting in Kurusu's briefcase. Thanks so much to GiveWell for not only helping everyone find highly effective charities, but also making sure that our donation dollars go further. The appointment of Hideki Tojo as Prime Minister seemed to put Japan on an inevitable path to war. But ironically, behind the scenes, it was the peace faction that considered him the best candidate. After all, even if a diplomatic solution could be found, the new Prime Minister would need to be somebody with military pull. He would need to get the army on board with any agreement, and probably put down riots and attempted coups after the announcement of said agreement. And shockingly, it appeared they were right. Tojo himself was stunned by the appointment, and once in office, the enormity of Japan's predicament hit him. He now represented the whole country, and realized how dubious the Navy was about whether they could win a war with the U.S. So at a series of high-level meetings in November, he reopened the question of a diplomatic solution. What could be done? Are we even sure we can win a war? What will be the consequences? He even proposed revisiting the decision from the Imperial Conference of September 6th laying out that if diplomatic efforts failed, war would be declared on America, Britain, and the Netherlands. This was unbelievable. Reversing an imperial decision was unprecedented in Japanese history. These contentious meetings lasted for up to 14 hours at a time. Several civilian leaders even suggested a war would be so devastating, it would actually be preferable for Japan to accept a time of economic hardship and humiliation rather than fight one. Though army leaders shot back quick, saying the country was already rationing and food prices spiking due to the American embargo. Better to declare war and have a small chance of victory than to accept the conditions of defeat without even fighting. But finally, Tojo and his new foreign minister, Shigenori Togo, emerged with a last-ditch effort for peace. They would make two proposals to Roosevelt, Proposal A and Proposal B. In Proposal A, Japan would agree to negotiate an end to the Sino-Japanese War make an initial troop drawdown, and withdraw all troops from China over a 25-year period. And in Proposal B, Japan would immediately reverse its troop movements to the southern portion of Indochina, freeze military deployments in Southeast Asia, and pledge to remove all troops from Indochina once the war in China was concluded. In return, America would end its aid to nationalist China, sell Japan oil, and broker trade agreements for rubber and other materials. Of course, they had greater hopes for Proposal B, since it was more concrete, immediate, and managed to avoid the thorny issue of China. The plan was to give Roosevelt Proposal A, then if it was declined, present Proposal B, and if both were turned down, it would be war. The military pressed for a new deadline, a date after which diplomacy was considered to have failed. Tojo managed to haggle almost a month out of them. So on November 5th, as Kurusu boarded his train, Tojo and his ministers sat down with Emperor Hirohito for a new imperial conference. They outlined the proposals, the dire costs of the American embargo, and the proposed attack on Pearl Harbor. The emperor gave his assent. If peace was not found by December 1st, the attack would go ahead. The next day, when Nomura presented Proposal A to Secretary of State Hull, he found him unenthusiastic. That was pretty much expected. What wasn't expected, however, was that Hull and Roosevelt would take until November 14th to formally turn it down. So much later than anticipated, Nomura and Kurusu tried Proposal B. What they didn't know at that juncture, however, was that Hull already knew about this alternate proposal. Because over at the Magic Program, its staff of military officers and code-breaking women, known as Code Girls, had already intercepted and deciphered the proposals when they were sent to Nomura via the Purple Code. 
So not only had Hull read both proposals, but he also read the government's instructions to Nomura about how to present them, which rubbed him the wrong way. See, while the magic program was good at cracking Japanese codes, they were bad at translation. The program was underfunded, understaffed, and had no native Japanese speakers. And because diplomatic communications were conducted in formal Japanese, the resulting translations, while substantively accurate, appeared harsher and more demanding than the originals. Translators also inserted and removed words and phrases, making it appear like there was no room to maneuver with basic errors like substituting the phrase final concessions with the more provocative ultimatum. Seriously, you put these things side by side and it is pretty glaring. Hull was also, by this time, simply disinclined to believe anything Japan said. Its horrifying massacres in China and obvious preparations to invade Southeast Asia, confirmed again by the Purple Intercepts, meant that despite his friendship with Nomura, he considered the negotiations untrustworthy. Not to mention, Hull also disliked Kurusu, seeing him as a Nazi ally, since he'd signed the Tripartite Act on behalf of Japan. So Hull and Roosevelt slow-walked their response to Proposition B, considering it carefully, as they also tracked Japanese forces moving into position outside of Hong Kong, in Indochina, and in ports across Japan. Purple intercepts and phone taps made it clear that Japan was talking peace, but preparing for war. To them, it appeared Japan was using diplomacy to stall their way to a better military position, and they were right. Secrecy around the Pearl Harbor attacks was incredibly tight, and the cabinet had specifically agreed to keep diplomats like Nomura and Kurusu out of the loop to make the bluff more convincing. Ensign Yoshikawa, the spy embedded in the Honolulu consulate from the episode earlier, didn't actually know either. He only knew he was supposed to pump drunk marines for information and to skin dive at night in the harbor channel looking for submarine nets. Increasingly, he was told to create a grid map of the harbor and cable what ships were berthed in which sections. It was clear to intelligence groups, both in the US and Britain, that Japanese forces were preparing to hit something, but what? Singapore? The Philippines? The Dutch East Indies, maybe? Perhaps some combination. That last one seemed the most likely. And for months, British and Dutch diplomats had begged Roosevelt for even a verbal agreement that the three powers would fight together should they be attacked. But still, Hull and Roosevelt remained evasive. An agreement was premature. They were still negotiating with Japan. However, they did send out an alert to U.S. forces in the Philippines, Midway, Wake, and Hawaii that a conflict might be coming. However, this warning was so vague that individual commanders interpreted it in wildly different ways. In the Philippines, it was seen as a caution that ships might strike Singapore, in which case America may need to provide air support. While at Pearl Harbor, it was seen as a warning of possible sabotage by the local Japanese-American population. An air commander responded by grouping planes close together on the runway where they were easier to guard and easier to bomb. But no one in the Roosevelt administration, apart from a few outliers, truly considered Pearl a target for a Japanese strike. To do it, the Imperial Japanese Navy would have to sail far north into freezing waters before turning down into the mid-Pacific tropics. They'd risk exposure if they were spotted by even a single merchant ship, aircraft, or PBY Catalina patrols out of Midway, and a surprise carrier-based air raid at such long range had never been done before. We assumed they had good sense, said one American commander after the war. Another admitted in racist terms that they simply didn't think the Japanese had the capability. Given the fleet movements, Roosevelt scrapped his more conciliatory counterproposal, and instead, he and Hull drew up a list of ten hardball points, known as the Hull Note, including a full Japanese troop withdrawal from China and Indochina, abandonment of the Tripartite Pact, and to cease supporting puppet governments in China. Then, Japan could return to most favored nation status, and both countries would leave China and they delivered that to Nomura, November 26th. On December 2nd, an undetected fleet under Admiral Nagumo, already a third of its way to Hawaii, received a coded message from Yamamoto. Climb Mount Nidaka. The code that diplomacy had failed, and that the attack would begin. And while we wait to hear about the dark days ahead in our historical tale, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about one of my current day bright spots, Give Well. Okay, let me ask you a question. When you give to a charity, how do you know how much impact your donations are really going to have? 
Look, I know that can be hard, if not impossible to answer, because you could do weeks of research to find charities and figure out what they do, how effective they are, and how the charity might use additional money. Or you could visit givewell.org and find free research and recommendations about the charities that can save or improve the most lives per dollar given. Yeah, we are sciencing the heck out of goodwill right now. Seriously, GiveWell is changing how people think about charities. They spend 40,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and then direct funding toward a few of the highest impact evidence-based opportunities that they find. Currently, over 100,000 donors have trusted GiveWell's research, and rigorous evidence suggests that their donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. But of course, there's still a lot of work to be done, and here is how you can help. Since GiveWell wants donors to make informed decisions about high-impact giving, they make using their research absolutely free. So you can go to their site and see all of their research and recommendations, no sign-up required. Not to mention, they'll allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity or fund you choose without taking a cut. Case in point, this holiday season, I used GiveWell to donate to the Malaria Consortium. Because I don't know how else to put this, but malaria is a truly nightmarish disease that kills something like 600,000 people annually, mostly kids and it always needs our support to help combat. And with GiveWell's research and stats, I was truly confident that the charity I chose would use what I could give to deliver high-impact, life-saving results. For real, I actually never felt so confident giving to a charity before, and that's a really awesome feeling. And here's a really cool part. If you've actually never donated to a GiveWell-recommended charity before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. So to claim that match before it runs out, go to givewell.org and right before checkout, pick YouTube from the How Did You Hear About Us drop down menu and then enter extra credits, which will lock in your match. Then you can feel doubly good that your donation dollars went as far as possible to help those in need. And honestly, if that's not giving well, I really don't know what is. It's like truth in advertising. Anyway, thank you so much for your time and kindness, everybody. Happy holidays. Well, shucks howdy there, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.